Out of the Ordinary Insights, brought to you by Investex Specialist Bank. Hello and welcome to this week's edition of Captains of Industry. My name is Kukuletu Mfupi. Today I have the pleasure of speaking to a very influential African businessman, a philanthropist, come politician. He is a leader of one of the biggest country companies rather within the African continent and he goes by the name of Mohamed Duji. He's also the first Tanzanian to appear on the cover of Forbes Africa magazine. Mohamed, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you very much. It's an absolute pleasure to have you with us. So you're also uh, at the age of 38, one of the youngest billionaires on the continent, yes. uh, a feat that not many people might be able to achieve. But despite all these successes and the great titles, you have humble beginnings, no doubt. Very, very much so, very much so. Funnily uh, that you ask, I actually was born at home. I didn't even make it to the hospital. Mm. And uh, I was born with uh, a midwife. And my mom says that she had 16 hours of labor. And things got so complicated. She says that I had the umbilical cord uh, surrounded me and my neck mm. and when things got really complicated in the end then they decided that the hospital was three hours away so all in all I was born safely at home on a table and uh, my mom was okay and I was okay so yes for sure very very humble beginnings very. in central Tanzania in a place called Singida mm. Uh, and uh, very much so, you know, my grandfather was from there, uh, my great-grandfather is buried there. So yes, very humble beginnings. Walk us through your roots, uh, in particular growing up in a country like Tanzania, as you mentioned, humble beginnings uh, being born on, on a table at yes. home. But uh, you got the opportunity as well to pursue your education and further your studies in the U.S., uh, many, many uh, kilometers and miles away from home. Yes, very much so. I was very fortunate, you know, my father was uh, very well to do. He was a, a rich man and he gave us the best of educations. And I actually did part of my high school in Orlando. I went to Trinity Prep and then I went to uh, Florida. I actually wanted to be a golf professional. Yeah. So I studied with people like Jennifer Capriati who were like at that time we were voted the most accomplished. But she was a Wimbledon champion and I was like a mere class president. But then we, I got out of there and I went to Georgetown University, of course, tuition fees was very expensive and my father paid for all of that. So I, I can't complain, he really gave us the best of education. How important is <coughs> the role that your father plays in your life at the moment? I know that he also helped establish the company which you lead right now, yes. Mohammed Enterprises Tanzania Limited. No, no, he, he's played a big role. I mean, if, if I have a role model, definitely it's him. He uh, always advises me, he's a visionary, but most importantly, he's a man that works hard. He's a man that's very difficult to compete with because all he does is think about business and think about making money the whole day. Mm -hmm. So yes, definitely, he's played a big, big role in terms of uh, discipline. He always wanted us to play sports, but play sports correctly, give us professional, uh, uh, lessons. Uh, he would spend a lot of money. All my brothers, we have 100 trophies at home. Wow. Some of us are golfers, some of us are tennis players. So he has put a lot of effort because he believed that sports uh, mold a person in terms of you learn how to win and lose and it gives you that discipline. So for sure, I mean, he has really uh, has played a big role and a great influence and he's a role model in my life. Judging by some of the research that I've done, it seems yes. as though the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. Because your wife says that you don't do things in moderation. You right. you also just as much of a hard worker and also work with, with utter determination. So uh, clearly it's it's something that runs in the DUG blood. Yeah, you know what, I think it all, um, it, it comes from my dad. I remember every Christmas and summer I would come back from Georgetown. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and he would say, and I would say, you know, I want to go out with my friends. And he would say, yeah, but your, fa your friend's father is a doctor. And the other ones is a is a dentist, but you know, unfortunately, your father is a businessman, so you can't. You have no time. You have to come to work. Mm. So he would work me every Christmas, every summer, and and I would say, but you know, what am I supposed to do? And he would make me sit right in front of him and say, just listen and observe. So for sure, I think he has given me that 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 discipline and instilled that discipline in me. 
uh, all along the years. Yeah. Walk us through your experience in the U.S. in particular, having that background of discipline from your father and mm -hmm. a young African man in a foreign land in the U.S., yes, yes. Uh, probably the promised land or the great land of opportunity. Yes. What was the, the, the ex your experience in the U.S. Of like? Of course, initially it was very difficult. Um, it's also a cultural shock. You mm -hmm. know, you're coming out of Tanzania. But of course, I went to an international school which was highly cosmopolitan, and I'd met a lot of foreign people as such. But uh, it was difficult because the whole education system was different. You know, we studied in the British system, mm. which is the ICG, uh, IGCSEs and the International Baccalaureate, where in the U.S. it was you had to study American history. Uh, but when I got into Georgetown, I mean, this is uh, top 20 schools uh, in, the, in, in the U.S. and very competitive. You know, every person you met was smart. And not only was smart, but they were hardworking and studied hard. So um, initially, it was very difficult to fit in because I had to study in English being my third or fourth language mm. because, you know, I speak Kiswahili. Uh, and then, of course, you know, I have an Indian heritage. So at home, we still speak Indian, mm. you know. Uh, so it was difficult. But then, of course, I, I got into the groove and I understood the system. But to be honest, I'll tell you something that the U.S., and Georgetown in specific has given me a big, big exposure and has opened my eyes. And in one way or the other, whatever success I have today, I have to partly you know, give credit to my university and to the US. Indeed, and, and, and coming back to that, yes. uh, you no doubt brought some of that experience back. You came back to Tanzania some years ago, yeah. ago to take over your father's business, and yeah. you've done amazing things with that company. Yeah. Moved it to from a million dollar making company to more than billions yeah. in, in the past year. What brought you back home? You know what? I actually got a job uh, when I graduated at uh, Wall Street, and uh, I was getting paid forty thousand dollars. Okay, and uh, that's a lot of money, Mohammed. Okay, and I will tell you, because $40,000 in the U.S., in New York, in Manhattan, is not much. I'll tell you why. Okay. So 40 grand, and then they would make me work 100-hour weeks. Literally, there were times we would fall asleep on the table, and the next day get up, and we had a shirt and a tie, and we would wear the same suit and go back to work. It was madness. We were drinking so much coffee, it was crazy. But end of the day, then they would give you $20,000 in bonus. So you have $60,000, and then you have 30% tax, so you have $40,000 net, hmm. okay? You try renting an apartment in Manhattan. You have a small box with a bathroom, and you would pay 2,500 a month. Wow. So all in all, I had no money. I had to still go out, I had to buy suits, you know, so I started calling my dad. I'm like, listen, you know, can you, you know, subsidize and help me? He's like, no, man, I'm not gonna, you better come back here because there's great opportunities. So basically that brought me back to Tanzania because I just realized, okay, I could have, you know, been in the corporate world and tried to, you know, climb the ladder, mm. but I realized that there was so much more opportunity back home, so I decided to come to Tanzania and start and join the business, the family business, where at that time my father was the one and only person that was running that business. I, I like how you mentioned that you came back for the opportunity to come yeah, back home yeah, and, yeah. and assist your dad with the business, yes. but more importantly, you had a vision. Yeah. And that vision was to not only assist your dad with his company, yes. but to help assist your people and your country. Very much so. And you've managed to do that. Yes, very much so. I mean, today I'll tell you something. One thing I'm very proud of is not the billions. One thing I'm proud of that METL Group employs 24,000 people. Mm. This is 4% of formal employment in Tanzania. So I actually look for industries where, of course, primarily I have to make money, but two, if I can employ people, uh, that would be the, the, the best feeling that I would have. Not only that, but you also contribute, uh, your company contributes 2% yes. of uh, the country's GDP. Yes. That is not a feat that any old entrepreneur or business owner can achieve. So clearly there's something different in, in your line of thinking as, as a business leader. Yes, yes. You know, initially, you know, when I came back and, you know, my father had a trading business and, you know, we import and export uh, sugar, rice and fertilizer and salt. We import from air conditioners to bubble gum to yeast. Wow. And we export all commodities in terms of, you know, cashew nuts and pigeon peas and cocoa beans that we export to chocolate manufacturers and so forth. Then I realized there was opportunity for agro-processing. 
and to be able to manufacture where you value add the products and you have a better margin. So we got into many, many industries. Today we have over 31 industries. And I'll mention some of the products that we, we, we manufacture, edible oils, cooking fats, margarine, soaps. When I say soaps, you know, you have bar soaps in Africa because people are poor. So you have mm. these soaps where actually they are multi-usable. So soap has been used for the body, soap has been used, same soap for utensils and for washing the clothes. But then as you know, things started growing, there's a middle class, that's when we went into toilet soaps and baby soaps and medicated soaps. Then we went into detergents. You know, as the urban population grows and they have more money, they spend that money in a much more better way. Uh, we're into milling, wheat milling to flour, maize milling, uh, rice milling, we're into textiles. We're the largest textile players in sub-Saharan Africa. Mm -hmm. If I tell you how much cloth we produce, you're not going to believe it. We produce 120 million meters of cloth. That is 120,000 kilometers of cloth. So, okay, the, the world's circumference is like 50,000. So I can pretty much wrap the world a couple of times with the cloth I produce. That's a huge So, amount. But it's all over time. Huh? We've built it, we, we have built it, we've worked hard. Of course, I have to thank uh, METL and my, my people and my team. They've been very dedicated and very disciplined and have given me a lot of support. Of course, mm -hmm. I have to thank you know, my, my mom. You know, she always prays for me. You know, she always just keeps on asking me when I come back home, every day you want to buy this business and you want to grow, but why? You know, she feels in one way or the other that I'm almost like ruining myself because I don't have time for myself and she feels that I'm like stressed. You so know? why do you do it then, Mohammed? If, if your own mother is concerned but yet yes. that drive and that ambition is still there, why continue? You know what, I, I believe life is short, mm. you know, and that's why we'll get into politics and I'll explain to you why I got into politics. I believe life is short, I believe that you you, money is not everything, mm. you know? Money means nothing because the moment you die, it's all over. So when you have or have accumulated that wealth, it is very important that how you be able to help people with that wealth. Because end of the day, I want to ask you a question. How much money does a person really need as a person? Not much. So when you accumulate wealth, you try to use that wealth. And now we have a foundation. I have more Devji Foundation. Mm -hmm. I have an NGO. So we try to help and support you know, communities in development, in education, and healthcare, and water. You know? Because I think uh, for one reason or the other, God has chosen some people to be very wealthy. Mm. You know? At the same time, with wealth comes responsibility. And that responsibility is to semi-distribute that wealth to people. A warm welcome back to Captains of Industry, where we're speaking to Mohammed Duji. He's a businessman, he's a philanthropist as well as a politician, someone who just before this ad break was mentioning that uh, some billionaires have a responsibility to redistribute wealth and leave some kind of contribution to humanity. And uh, Mohammed, uh, moving away from the business sphere, you're also a politician. Uh, humble beginnings even when you became a politician, because when you were 25 back in 2001, you, uh, were vote you wanted to have a seat in Parliament, but you were told that you were too young. Young. Yes. That must I, have been a bit of a shocker, but uh, a few years later you managed to get your seat in Parliament and you, you, you're changing the, the, the sphere of politics in Tanzania at the moment. Very, very much so. You know, when I got back from the U.S. and I, I went back home and I said that I wanted to go back to Singida, where I was born. I mean, mm. this is a town in between of nowhere. It's central Tanzania. Uh, it's a peri-urban constituency uh, with rural peripherals and so forth. So when I got back there, I realized that the poverty was immense. And I, I, I want to share a story. I met this old man. There was a puddle of yellow water, and there was a bucket. And he would take the plate and try to scoop that water and put it into the bucket. And I asked him, so what are you doing? He's like, this is the water we drink. Mm. And I said, I don't believe you, because I was from the US. Mm. You know? So he took me home, and I see kids drinking yellow water in PET bottles. So I did some research. You know, Because the education level was so low, half of the kids you know, when they get ill, they get treated, you know, at village level. 
and by the time the things get really bad and have big waterborne diseases, mm. they're taken to the hospitals and a lot of them lose their lives. Now, I have children, I love my children, and I know every parent loves their child the way I love my child. And life equals to life. You cannot tell me that a child in the US, his life is more valuable than a child in Africa. Mm. So this guy says, you know, my, at that time he says that, my minister is, uh, my MP is the minister of water. So of course that was shocking. He's like, why don't you become our MP? So you know, I went back and I tell my dad, I want to run for parliament. He's like, you're crazy. We're business people, stick away from this, you know? He says, no, no more, because you've been supporting football, you can run for any constituency in Tanzania. Why you want to go and fight with a you know, minister? I said, no, if I want to be an MP, I want to be an MP from Singida, because that is where I'm from, and I want to represent my people. So I ran, like you rightly said, and I won big time. Mm. I mean, I got like 94% votes. This minister was devastated. Mm. What hit him? Of course, at that time, you know, CCM, like the ANC told me, you know, that uh, I was too young, inexperienced. So of course, I stepped back. How did it make you feel, though? Because when you've got so much drive and <coughs> so much ambition and are so determined I to cried. change the sphere. I cried. <laughs> you cried. Because what happened was that at that time, the president was also from my party. Mm. And I had to go back because people, you know, there was an uproar because, you know, people were burning flags, you know, gave back the cards of the party. Sure. So it was a little bit of a mess when this happened, right? So I had to go back and some said, you know, I'm moving to an opposition party and so forth. So I had to go back and campaign for the candidate that was chosen. Mm. And then when the president came and he, he called upon me into the stage and there was like 30,000 people and there were cheering for me. They were cheering for me and of course I had to speak and I was so young I started crying because I was just, you know, I felt bad about mm. it. But all in all, you know, it's all good, you know. I, I ran again 2005 and I ran 2010 and I, uh, I've, I've been a sitting MP for it and they've been overwhelmingly, you know, giving me votes uh, above 85, 90 percent. Uh, we have done big things. We had two secondary schools. We've going to 22 schools. I give scholarships to half of the kids mm. uh, in my constituency. They go to school for free. You know, we've been fighting HIV, we've been fighting malaria. You know, water, that, what took me there, you know? I mean, I've spent a couple of million dollars. Accessibility of water was 23%, today it's 83%. Mm. And God willing, 2015 uh, will be 100% when my term comes to an end. I have to, you know, say something that it needs a lot of sacrifice, you know? Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you, my wife, she's been so tolerant with me and she has sacrificed so much because she takes care of the kids, you know, and gives them uh, the education and, and, and she's always there for them while I'm always away, you know? So I have to always thank her because literally I am what I am is because of her. But I'm, of course, I'm on the Forbes and I'm on CNBC and I'm on Captains of Industries and she's not there. But I have to tell you that, that she has played a great, great role uh, in my life. So we're going to Davos now next week. So she's coming with me. So I'm very excited oh, to spend fantastic. a week with her. Yeah. Fantastic, yes. in, in, the, in the rather chilly hills and yes. uh, mountains of, of Switzerland. Yes. But uh, coming back to the political story yes. there, would you ever run for president then with all the support that you have, yes. not only from a, 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 a citizenship perspective, yes. but from yes. your wife as well? Yeah, you know, one thing I'll tell you that um, I'm primarily an entrepreneur. Uh. And you know, I got into politics because to be able to deliver and give that support. So in actual sense, no, I would not never run for president because I, 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 of course, if I did, if I didn't have business, then maybe I would think about it. <laughs> but I have so much business and it's driving me crazy as it is today. Um, if you look at in terms of attendance uh, in parliament, uh, I'm quite bad. So, you know, when you're talking about presidency, <laughs> you know, you have to be there to run uh, the country. Uh, but we have a great president and our, uh, our party has been in power for over 50 years. Uh, our country is very stable and Tanzanians in general are very, very good people. I, I love how you're so passionate about your country and yes. you speak with it with such heart and such feeling and, yes. and, 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 
uh, it, it almost brings about memories of the change that also took place politically in, in you know, sub-Saharan uh, uh, countries, yes. like when South Africa reached freedom with democracy, as well as the changes that took place in Zimbabwe, Zambia, we mm. could go on and on. Yes. But coming back to the political relationship uh, between South Africa and uh, uh, Tanzania, yes. we, we saw that being highlighted again at the recent funeral of uh, former statesman Nelson Mandela when President Kikwete yes. uh, shared his memories of, of that former statesman. From a African perspective, when it comes to politics and when it comes to business, do you believe that there is a united pan-Africanism front, perhaps, or, or are we lacking in that regard? We, we, we are definitely lacking. Of course, Tanzania has historically has played a big role, mm. uh, not only to support the ANC and the whole movement against apartheid, but you talk about Mozambique, Felimo. I mean, Tanzanians have died fighting along Felimo. So we've given our blood for Mozambicans. Mm. We've supported SWAPO, we've supported ZANU-PF and President Mugabe's movement. We've supported Kenneth Kaunda. During that time, there was apartheid. Why do you think the Tanzania-Zambia railway was built? Because they didn't want to ship anything out of Durban, because mm. there was a, a, a huge apartheid issues and so forth. Uh, so Mwali Munyerere has played a big Pan-African uh, role. But coming back to your question, I think, imagine we're in Africa today. If I want to go to England, I can get a five-year or ten-year visa, mm. okay? You try getting a five-year or ten-year visa to, let's say, a country like Ivory Coast. It's very difficult. A lot of red tape. Very much so. So, you know, I think uh, as Africans, you know, we need to realize that this is our continent and this is the continent that I feel the most growth in the next 50 years will come out from. And the more united we are, the better we will do. But so far, sometimes I have, I'm quite spe uh, skeptical mm -hmm. uh, on, on, on the uniformity of our policies and try to work together. Because if you look at even, you know, trading blocks, you have mm. SADAC, you know, and then you have East African community, and then you have COMESA, mm. and then, of course, the West Africans have ECOWAS, you know. So still between these blocks, there's trading barriers. You know, rather than today, the European Union has one block. Exactly. So why should we, as, and if you look at our GDP vis-a-vis -vis the GDP of uh, Europe, is much sl smaller. So why can we not have one Africa, you know, without any trade barriers? Mm -hmm. So I still think that our presidents and the African Union, you know, need to derive uh, a vision for Africa for the next 50 years. What's your vision for Africa? I think, you know what, um, I believe, you know, of course, we've had a lot of wars and so forth mm. in the past. I think that is kind of getting to the end. I know, you know, recently you've heard about South Sudan and mm. you have problems here and there in Central African Republic. But I think that at least for the next 50 years, I think wars, uh, because, you know, they destroy countries, you know. So we have three, four, five African countries with problems like Somalia and so forth. I believe, my speculation is, within the next 50 years, it will be all be sorted. One, I think, as governments, we believe, and you asked, you know, Mohammed, about presidency. And I said, you know, if I was a president, I would create an inducive environment for investors. Hmm. Okay? Investors come in, you do two things for me. You pay me taxes, okay, and you employ my people. Yes. With those taxes, I as a government will make sure that I don't misuse those taxes mm. and try to channel them in infrastructure projects and, and, and social services that are going to support my countrymen. You know? Mm. And that's what I would do. Simple, of course, it sounds easy, but of course, it's very difficult. Exactly. So I think as Africa, we should focus on making sure that we collect taxes, we collect the money, and we channel it in the right place, you know, and those guys that are coming in and investing in our countries, you know, they employ our people because unemployment is a big, big issue, mm. and it's a time bomb. The youth, if you look at the statistics in Africa, the youth population is growing. And, and underutilized. Yes, and that is what scares me sometimes. Underutilized. Yes. Mohammed, you've got such a beautiful vision as to uh, where we can take the direction of, of our continent to yeah. and perhaps also influence the world. But uh, you're a billionaire, you're an entrepreneur, yeah. you're a politician, you're a philanthropist. Uh, all these titles yeah. uh, hang around on, on your shoulders and on your head. But what kind of legacy do you hope to leave behind someday? 
You know, my dear, you know, legacy is a very big word, you know. I actually don't believe in legacy, yeah. you know. I don't believe in legacy because I believe that when you die, it's all over, you know. I'm a Muslim. We believe in hell and heaven and the day of judgment and God will judge you. Mm. Now, of course, there are very few people in this world that have left such a strong legacy like Madiba, like Gandhi, you know. Uh, most of others that have done well, I've been forgotten. And it's very, it's, it's, it's a human nature to forget people that die mm. unless you have made a very, very big impact. So I, you know, my, I have a personal thing, you know, that I want to do the best in my capacity to and, and help as many people as possible uh, in education, in healthcare. And you know, I don't help outside Africa because A, I'm born in Africa. I make my money in Africa. Hmm. So today, if I hear there's a problem in, uh, let's say, Sri Lanka, I'm not going to take my money there because literally we have kids, we have problems in Africa. Charity Why should I not look for causes within Africa? Mm. So all in all, to answer your question, God is my judge, you know, and I am going to do the best that I can, you know, in, in, from my heart. And I'm not thinking, you know, when I die, that what people are going to think about me, because you know what, literally, I don't care. Mohammed, such a pleasure speaking to you. We've gained phenomenal insights, uh, both from a political perspective as well as business. And uh, we wish you all the best. You're definitely someone with a Midas touch. So I'd like a billion dollar handshake. Thank you <laughs> and very we've much. And got that on camera. And, and I'll tell you something, 2018, METL is going to be a $5 billion revenue company and hopefully employ 100,000 people. And contribute even more to Tanzania's GDP. Thank you. Thank you. Mohammed Juji, thank you so much thank for you your time. Thank you very much. God bless you. God bless you too. Well, thank you so much to Mohammed Juji, who is an entrepreneur. He's a businessman. He's the chief executive of Mohammed Enterprises Tanzania Limited, as well as philanthropist and politician. Well, that does bring our edition of Captains of Industry to an end for this week. Do join us again next time.